afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. On behalf of the National Security Law Students Association, it is my honor to welcome you to this timely and important discussion of one of the oldest traditions in American politics, the transition of power. I'll keep this introduction brief because we have an amazing panel, and I know that we're all eager to learn from those who are in attendance here today. But before I hand it off, I want to start by recognizing uh, two programs. First, the election law program at Ohio State, which has been dedicated since 2004 to helping the public, educators, and policymakers alike better identify and understand issues confronting the world of election administration. This fall, the election law program partnered with SCOTUS blog to track what was at one point over 250 election related cases in the lead up to November's election. And one of its distinguished members who is with us here today, Professor Foley, has written so many opinion pieces in the Washington Post recently that my friends in DC know more about him than I do and I took his constitutional <laughs> law class. Uh, I would also like to recognize Ohio State's Mershon Center for International Security Studies, which focuses on advancing interdis interdisciplinary and collaborative approaches to national, international, and human security. Finally, I'd like to introduce the organizer and moderator of this event, Professor Dakota Rudisil. Uh, Professor Rudisil is a law professor here at Ohio State, a co-leader of uh, security and Governance Research at the Mershon Center, and an alumnus of the Obama-Biden transition team. With that, I think it's time to start our panel. Thank you, everybody, and I hope that you uh, enjoy the panel. Professor Rudisil. Well, thanks so much, Jacob, for that uh, terrific welcome on behalf of our outstanding students here at Ohio State, uh, and welcome to each of you to today's discussion of the U.S. national leadership transition, um, how handoffs typically work, and this very unusual year's uncertainties. Um, as Jacob mentioned, my name is Dakota Rudisil of the Moritz College of Law and the Mershon Center for International Security Studies. And I'm gonna be your host and your moderator uh, for today's uh, discussion. Today's discussion is the latest in a series of Zoomed events sponsored by the Mershon Center and by uh, our election law at Ohio State program, uh, focusing on the 2020 election. We've given particular attention to election law questions, to national security implications, uh, and to the impact of our disrupted and stressful times. Uh, times of pandemic disease, spiraling partisanship, uh, and racism-related civil unrest. Uh, 12 years ago, it was my honor to serve on the Obama-Biden transition team. That was a very by-the-book, buttoned-up operation um, keeping with the winning candidates, no drama Obama reputation, and in keeping with the crisp professional style of the outgoing president, uh, George W. Bush. In contrast, the 2016-2017 transition uh, to Donald Trump's administration was, uh, as one might expect if you've watched uh, Trump over the years, it was chaotic, it was norm-defying, um, and in some respects arguably involved violation of the law with regard to ethics and the Logan Act ban on people who are not currently in the executive branch uh, working to frustrate the foreign policy of the United States. This year, uh, the now incumbent President Donald Trump uh, has refused to concede. Uh, indeed, this morning he tweeted, I won the election, an assertion immediately slapped with an elegantly brief warning by Twitter. Official sources called this election differently. Meanwhile, the current administration has very unusually uh, re relieved and replaced many top national security officials in recent days. Uh, thousands of people, meanwhile, are seeking appointments in the new administration. Uh, the Biden-Harris transitions team uh, have not been allowed to visit uh, agencies. Um, and an immense amount of work remains to be done before Inauguration Day on January 20th. Uh, political appointees need to be identified, they need to be vetted, their backgrounds reviewed, and the top cabinet people uh, need to be reviewed and, and con confirmed by the Senate. Um, a campaign platform needs to be turned into executive orders and legislative proposals and speeches for the administration's first days. The new team needs to get up to speed with what the federal agencies are up to, and the new team, from the president on down, need to get up to speed on current intelligence uh, and be confident that they are entering office with any potential financial conflicts of interest resolved without uh, concerns about foreign intelligence contacts and without concerns about uh, criminal uh, records. Uh, to help us understand this blizzard of current and urgent issues, uh, we have the assistance of an outstanding panel of experts uh, composed of uh, top scholars uh, and practitioners. 
I'll go in order uh, of which we will we will hear from our each of our panelists. Um, our our next speaker will be my uh, esteemed colleague here at the Moritz College of Law, Professor Ned Foley, uh, who is director of our election law at Ohio State program. Uh, he will address the status of the presidential election and key process steps going forward between now and uh, Inauguration Day. Next, we will hear from Martha Joint Kumar, who is director of the partisan White House transition. Um, she will address how presidential transitions work. Um, inevitable, uh, uh, practical uh, uh, matters sometimes insert them into Zoom events in our times. Uh, so after, um, after Martha, Martha Joint Kumar uh, addresses how presidential transitions work, um, we'll hear from uh, Megan Casella who's a reporter at Politico um, focusing on the transition. And she will, she will discuss how the current transition is going right now. Next up, uh, and in keeping, with our, uh, the, in keeping with the national security theme of the events that we've been hosting this year, uh, David Priest, uh, a former CIA officer who has written the book on briefing of uh, top people from the president on down, uh, David will address uh, intelligence briefings uh, for the new uh, the new spy masters. Next, we will hear from one of my colleagues from the Obama Biden transition, uh, Petra Smeltzer, um, who is now serving uh, on the Biden Harris transition team, um, and will talk with us about uh, the ethics regime and avoiding conflicts of interest. Um, Finally, and certain, but certainly last but certainly not least, is uh, my longtime colleague uh, and friend, Bill Doster, former counsel to the Senate Majority Leader, uh, who has also served at the White House. Uh, Bill will talk to us about the transition in Congress, um, the transition between Congresses, how the presidential transition uh, involves the Congress. Um, and uh, then after that point, we will then transition to uh, Q&A um, with all of you. I will provide a little bit more guidance on Q&A from our participants, uh, our non-panelist participants when we get there, but generally what we'd ask you to do is to use the, uh, use the Q&A function uh, on your Zoom link, and uh, then Kyle from Rashan and I will, will, will go through the questions and direct them to our panelists. Um, and I would, I, I would ask you, when you do post questions, either identify if they're for the, for the full panel or if they are for a particular uh, panelist. Okay, so with that introduction, I want to get us into hearing from our, our expert panel. Um, we're going to start with my colleague Ned Foley here from the Moritz College of Law at The Ohio State University. Um, Ned will talk with us about uh, where we stand with the election uh, right now, um, how the Constitution's structure and how other laws uh, and traditions and norms uh, shape the process going forward, and just give us an overall sense of the of the process steps that lie between today uh, and Election Day. Professor Foley. Uh, thanks, Dakota. Um, first, I just want to say how much I value, uh, in so many ways, the partnership that we've been able to develop this year in, in planning for uh, where we are now. Um, fortunately, some of the worst case scenarios that we envisioned uh, haven't transpired and won't transpire, but uh, I don't have national security expertise the way Dakota does, and I, you know, normally election law doesn't involve national security issues. But um, both of us saw um, before January, even before the COVID uh, crisis hit, that there were issues that we should anticipate, and so it's just been a great partnership to to do that. So I, I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, so one of the things that I've written um, over the last couple of weeks is that in America, we really have two different systems for thinking about uh, bringing elections to a close. We have the legal system, and then we have a cultural system. And they operate, unfortunately, on, par on different tracks and on different timetables. And we're struggling this year uh, to bring the two together. Um, the legal track is much slower, right? Congress is the institution uh, that officially declares a president-elect in the United States, and it occurs under the 12th Amendment. Uh, Congress picks the date, it's January 6th. And so that's how we, as a matter of law, get an official declaration of who our president-elect is. 
but it's only two weeks before inauguration day, not enough time for a transition as a practical matter. Uh, and culturally also, we're an impatient people. We've never wanted to wait uh, for either the electoral college to meet in December or Congress to confirm the electoral college outcome in January for us to practically reach a sense of finality and closure uh, on, a, on a presidential election. And so therefore a whole separate system is developed culturally with its sets of norms and expectations that are just well in advance of the legal process, but you know, do not have legal status. So when the networks call an, a race, whether they usually do it on election night or they do it Saturday after election day as happened this year, uh, that's very important culturally, um, but it has no, no legal status. Um, you know, and if I might add, I mean, when President Trump tweets today that he's won the election, that's not true. He's <laughs> lost the election. That will officially be confirmed as the process moves forward in the way that we say. But, you know, Dakota, I picked up on a word that you used in terms of the Twitter response. When Twitter says that, that that's been disputed by official sources, Twitter is factually false in that respect. <laughs> you know, the networks calling the election has no official status whatsoever. Not when the AP does it, not when the New York Times does it, not when NBC does it. None of those are official. Those are all media institutions that are entitled to their First Amendment rights to call it as they see it based on their own analysis, but they, they have no legal status. So, you know, if Twitter wanted to actually be accurate <laughs> about, the, uh, about the truth of the matter, it would have to retract its own statement there and say, it is true that President Trump hasn't won, but there is no official declaration of, of victory yet. And I, and I point that out just to show how hard a time we're having, um, you know, in our society this year, kind of navigating these two different uh, path, pathways. Again, normally on the cultural side, what happens is you get those networks projecting winners and then you get the candidate that is projected to lose, according to the networks, giving a concession speech based on the network projections. That concession speech has no legal status, but that's a signal that then allows the projected winner to give a victory speech. And then it's on the basis of that informal closure, the acknowledgement of defeat by the losing candidate well in advance of an official legal declaration, the declaration of victory, um, by the winning candidate that allows us culturally to say, okay, as a practical matter, we've reached a conclusion. And therefore, as a society, we can refer to the winner as the president elect, even though that's well in advance of any legal status as president elect that would be given by, by Congress. Um, you know, I, I, I think it was uh, appropriate for, uh, pr and I'm happy to call uh, president elect Biden, president elect Biden based on my belief that that's the correct way to understand it, given the cultural side of this dichotomy. Um, and I think it was appropriate for President-elect Biden to give his victory speech um, on Saturday night after the networks called it. But I do think it's important to note that it's unusual to get a victory speech uh, prior to a concession speech. Now, again, given President Trump, it was reasonable not to expect a concession speech to be forthcoming, uh, especially not based on, uh, on the network projections. But, um, you know, if, again, if one's thinking about it in terms of the relationship between the legal side and the political side, um, you know, the, a, a, a declaration of victory in advance of a concession speech is, is at least noteworthy. Um, frankly, I thought President Bush, uh, former President Bush on Sunday struck exactly the right note in his statement, both congratulating President-elect Biden on his victory, referring to him as President-elect Biden, uh, signaling that that was the result of a free and fair election with integrity and that all Americans should respect that. At the same time, if you looked at um, President Bush's uh, speech, he acknowledged that President Trump did have the right to pursue uh, legal avenues if he thought there was a reason to pursue them. President Bush simply said he didn't expect that those legal uh, pursuits would lead to any other conclusion than the one that was, you know, obvious based on the network projections uh, and that we should, you know, congratulate uh, President-elect Biden on that victory. Um, frankly, from my own take on how best uh, the country could have put together these two um, different 
truths, if you will, the cultural and the legal. Uh, again, there were several senators uh, on the Republican side who were quickly willing to congratulate President-elect Biden in the same way that President Bush did. Um, as a practical matter, and I, and I wrote this for the Washington Post, that means I think Biden has uh, reached the magic number of 50 in the US Senate uh, for January 6th, which is just as important as the magic number of 270, if you wanna sort of think about where we are uh, in terms of the legal process. Uh, you know, the fact that Senators Romney, Collins, Murkowski, and Sass have all uh, taken the step equivalent to President Bush means that, you know, I think if there were to be any um, challenge, which I don't even anticipate, or reaching Congress on January 6th, uh, I think it's clear that uh, President-elect Biden has the votes that he needs, and that's sufficient under our, our law. Um, but, you know, it is noteworthy that Senator McConnell on Monday uh, did not speak in quite the same vein that President Bush did or some of the other uh, Republicans like Senators Romney and Collins and Murkowski and Sass did. And so we're still in a little bit of a limbo sat status, as I think all of you know, in terms of how uh, the, the caucus as a whole on the Republican side in the Senate are, are processing this. They were emphasizing uh, the legal side of the, of, of the process, that there are these legal uh, procedures to uh, complete certification of the counting of the votes, recounts where necessary in Georgia, potentially Wisconsin, the lawsuits that, that are pending. Um, you know, I'm still optimistic and hopeful that uh, when the dust settles, as it's starting to settle, you'll see Leader McConnell and other Senate Republicans um, getting to a statement that's functionally equivalent to what President Bush has done um, and, and, and sort of recognizing the validity of, of President-elect Biden's victory in the way that they still haven't quite said that. But, uh, but in terms of timetable again, uh, you know, Senator McConnell saying he's waiting for thing, legal events like certification to, to come forward and those haven't, haven't happened yet. Um, so just to uh, wrap up, I think analytically in my mind, there's three different challenges that this um, difficulty of bringing culture and law together pose for us. One is, is there any risk of kind of destabilizing what seems to be the legal inevitability that the networks have projected? Um, and I think the answer to that, again, is emphatically no for reasons that I said. I, I don't foresee any step of the way. None of the lawsuits that are pending, and most of them are collapsing. So many of them collapsed again today. Um, so I, I think we can be very confident that uh, the Electoral College meeting that takes place on December 14th will result in a, what looks like 306 electoral votes cast for President-elect Biden. Um, and I'm not anticipating any rival submissions of electoral votes on behalf of President Trump going to Washington. I think the idea that that might have taken place is, is fizzling out. But if it did take place again, I think Congress would emphatically accept the electoral votes on behalf of Biden. So I don't think there's any risk there. Um, I do think there is significant practical risk to the transition process that we've been hearing about on the news in terms of presidential daily briefings, all of the components of a successful transition as a practical matter, and, and I'll leave it to others to talk about that. That's less of an election specific issue. And then finally, I'll put on the table what I do think is a significant concern and will be a concern if Senate Republicans as a caucus don't end up accepting the validity of President-elect Biden's victory. And that is, and we've heard a lot of people talk about this as well, as a matter of doing democracy in competitive two-party politics, the losing party as a party has to accept the validity of the winner's election when that is demonstrable. And even if President Trump is incapable of accepting the demonstrable validity of President-elect Biden's victory, the Republican party as a party in Congress has to get to the point where it accepts that the way the President Bush does. And if, and if the party doesn't, we are really in a very dangerous place uh, for our democracy that has implications, I think, both for the transition and for governance going forward. Uh, so those are my thoughts, Dakota. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ned. Um, uh, uh, incisive, uh, concise, uh, informative for us as always. So um, thanks so much. And we look forward to coming back to you during, during Q&A. Um, 
I want to know. I want to go now to uh, Martha Joint Kumar, who's uh, director of the nonpartisan uh, transition project. Um, you know, as we've been, uh, uh, as I was listening to Ned and, and mentioning, you know, and, and his reference to the, you know, the spiraling, uh, you know, partisanship we've seen and how that's been shaping some of the dynamics about. Uh, you know, the usual uh, concession and people in Congress of, you know, the losing party acknowledging that, um, I, you know, I, I was I was thinking about how things, you know, have worked in other states and do, you know, over history. Um, and our system stands in such contrast to parliamentary systems like the United Kingdom, where um, in the United Kingdom, when the prime minister loses a vote of no confidence, um, the, the moving vans show up at 10 Downing Street and the, the prime minister and his or her family are immediately ushered out. Uh, the transition is rapid and all, um, in contrast, we have this presidential system with a, you know, regular and structured elections and this very long transition period. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a different type of government, uh, set up. Um, and indeed, many people not, might not be aware of this, but in fact, our transition starts even before election day. The transition teams are already at work. So to help us understand that, how the, how the transition project uh, works, um, we're just so delighted to go to Martha Joint Kumar, who has, and I will plug her book here, she has literally written the book on presidential transitions called Before the Oath. Um, and is respected by uh, people on everyone, both sides of the aisle um, on this matter. So uh, uh, Professor Kumar, uh, over to you. You're right, thank you. Um, thank you very much, both Dakota and, and Ned for your remarks. Uh, let me start with a uh, story that gives an example of a good, uh, a good transition. In, uh, in 2009, at the time of the inauguration, uh, there is a, um, an informal tradition that the president-elect, his wife, the vice president-elect, his wife, meet together with uh, the incumbent president and vice president. And during the time in uh, 2009, when, uh, when they were meeting, in uh, the Situation Room, you had another meeting going on. Uh, with another type of discussion uh, rather than informal banter uh, that was taking place in the blue room. In the uh, sit room, they were talking about a threat on the inauguration. That threat had come up over, over the weekend. And um, together, you had the uh, incoming and outgoing chiefs of staff um, Homeland Security, uh, in and out Chertoff and Napolitano. Um, you had the National Security Advisors and you had uh, State Department. And, um, and together, the whole group um, and some, uh, some aid, aides too, I believe. Well, Bolton, uh, Josh Bolton uh, was there and, and running the meeting along with Rahm Emanuel, <clears throat> who was the incoming chief of staff. So together, they talked about what the threat on the inauguration was, what type of threat it would be. Um, their intelligence was that it would not be right at the podium but it would be further back and that it would be um, one where rather than a truck or something like that, it was gonna be a person. And um, probably, um, probably back towards the, um, uh, uh, towards the, the Washington Monument uh, and that area. <laughs> And so they had to go through, if that happened, uh, uh, what would they do? And they were able to work on a very collegial matter, uh, manner on that. And the reason why they could discuss it openly uh, with each other uh, in, a, um, in a collegial manner was that everybody had met everybody. They had all talked together because during the lead up to that transition, um, 
President Bush had decided in December of 2007 uh, that he wanted to start thinking about transition. And he brought in Josh Bolton and told him that uh, with two wars, he wanted to make sure they had the best transition possible and that he tasked him with it. And um, then he set that in motion. At the, around the same time, Steve Hadley, who was the national security advisor, also began his process where he thought it was important to let the people coming in know um, what the situations were in a, uh, a variety of countries and on a variety of issues. And so he had prepared, he worked with the NSC staff um, on preparing short memos on issues in countries. He then had those uh, memos would look at uh, what the state of an, of an issue or relationship with the country was when they came in, what they did, what the situation was going, going out. And those um, memo, memoranda were staffed, <clears throat> uh, were sent around to, um, to the intelligence community, um, defense and uh, state. And so um, when he wanted to make sure that when they did come in that they were gonna have a good understanding. And they got those memos um, when the, um, uh, when Obama was, um, was declared the winner. But he went further than that, that what Hadley did was he thought that in addition to memos, you need to bring people in, in the NSC, people are appointed in the, to the NSC, bring them in, have them sit next to the people uh, who, are, who they are replacing and have them talk through certain things. One of the uh, people I talked to said um, that it really was useful because there were things you could discuss that you wouldn't write down. And so for example, he was talking um, to a person that um, uh, was discussing the ways in which you could break up the geography of the NSC and said, well, you might wanna do it this way um, it seems like a good way of doing it, but we tried it and it didn't work. And this is why it didn't work. So you had relationships established too between the cabinet secretaries. Um, for example, um, uh, Chertoff and Janet Napolitano, they had known each other because they had both been uh, prosecutors, I believe. But um, they talked about um, uh, the issue and how long in the uh, meeting, um, uh, how long the Chertoff should stay around to, uh, to help Napolitano. And he asked her if she would like him to stay, that he was willing, uh, you know, he was willing to stay if she felt that she needed him. And she asked him, yes, please, please do. But they had already talked. Condoleezza Rice had already um, known Hillary Clinton, among other things, she gave a dinner for her and uh, brought together key State Department and White House people so that in uh, an informal setting, they could talk through whatever issues that, uh, that she wanted to discuss. Um, they also had met together through the tabletop exercise that was uh, done uh, in, in early January. And the tabletop exercise of a crisis was important because people could, um, could the incoming um, Obama team could get a sense that these are the issues that you are dealing with. It's not like, it's not like campaigning. This is governing. These are the, the threats. The, that uh, that you're going to have to uh, to work with. Um, so uh, that kind of work is not laid out in 
uh, in the 1963 Presidential Transition Act or any of its amendments of things that you have to do. But that is the gray area that's really important for a new team coming in, really understanding what, um, uh, how, things, uh, how things work and, uh, and providing their own, uh, their own help. Um, when you look at what this transition is going to be like, it's, um, it's doubtful that you're going to have those kinds of relationships. But what you are going to have is you're going to have a lot of paper, a lot of work that has been done throughout the federal government. In the 1963 Act, um, what, they, what they wanted was um, access for an incoming team and cooperation with the administration, with the president and, uh, and his team. Uh, they, in looking um, and going through the, um, uh, the hearings in, uh, uh, for the 63, the 62 and 63 Act, they talked about the, the transitions from uh, Truman to Eisenhower and Eisenhower to Kennedy. And then in both cases, uh, the, in, the incoming president uh, received information earlier on national security uh, issues. Truman had Eisenhower uh, read in on uh, the CIA briefings uh, during the summer of 19. 1952 after he became a candidate. Um, if, since so many of you are interested in, um, in national security, one of the uh, interesting books you might read is one uh, by John Helgerson. Uh, Helgerson was briefed, uh, uh, developed the, um, the daily brief, and he talks about the whole process of, of how it worked. Um, but you had had a real feeling of cooperation there. And the idea was to institutionalize that process. And, and so what you have is transition law from there where you have the General Services Administration as the key player providing office space and services. From there, gradually, through experiences and changes in demands on government and in the environment, you have it moving from, um, from just the GSA and some, and some resources and, uh, and, and briefings to an all of government operation. And, um, and with presidential leadership, very important to the process. And you see that this year, uh, for the first time, in a um, uh, in a transition that's not after eight years. The eight-year transitions are a lot easier to bring about because they've had the time. The president has had the time to prepare. Um, the four-year uh, one, where the president is um, is running for re-election and fails. Is, um, is another type of transition. So in uh, 2012, um, Obama elected not to take advantage of the recommendation of, um, of an earlier, of a 2010 legislation that called for the creation of a White House Transition Coordinating Council. And, uh, you know, who wants to tell people that he's organizing to, you know, for, for his own uh, leaving the White House. So they, they did not elect to do that. So in the 2015 uh, legislation, the uh, Presidential uh, Transitions Improvements Act, in, in that one, they provided that six months before the election, you have to have a White House Transition Coordinating Council in place and you have to have an agency transition directors council. Now, what they do is that the uh, transition coordinating council sets policy for the transition. 
The people heading it are Mark Meadows and Chris Lydell. Chris Lydell, whose name you never hear of, but, um, and that is by his design, um, was the executive director of Romney's uh, transition operation in 2012, which was the first time of a, that there was a pre-elect uh, transition operation. And so he knows transitions. He was the, he was the CFO of Microsoft and um, General uh, Motors, and he knows management as well. So he's the one that's really uh, working this from the White House side. And what they did is then give instructions to the agency's Transition Directors Council, which has 15, the representatives of 15 departments and then um, there's seven agencies that are involved in transitions like the Office of Government Ethics. Um, well, GSA is the Federal Transition Coordinator is the uh, co-chair of that with Mike Regas, who was the deputy for management. And, and so what they do is then figure out um, what information should be put together in these briefing books. And one of the things they do is they talk to people who have come in and want to know from them what information was useful for you. And so I think they found that people don't like big briefing books because it, they don't have the time to read them. And so they try to tailor the information to the needs of the uh, people that are coming in. These are career people that are on that council. And so they are uh, very interested in making sure that there is continuity and that people have all the information they need, whether it's, it's programs or, or uh, budgets, um, schedules. One of the things they take into account, um, and I would say the Transition Coordinating Council too, too does, is your, the president-elect is hopping on a moving train. The government's not, not stopping. Our uh, enemies and allies aren't stopping. Um, you have to get on that train and be prepared to do so and to lead it. Um, so I, um, all of that information is ready. The work that uh, GSA did pulling together um, the, um, uh, the timetables, the reports, uh, they did a very good job. It's just stalled at, the, stalled at the gate. But once it opens, there is a lot of information there. I'll stop there. Okay. <laughs> I could go on, but <laughs> I'll spare well, you. <laughs> well, no. Uh, uh, so uh, thank you so much, Martha. This is, this is so informative for our, for our conversation. And uh, we'll, we look forward to coming back to you to continue to discuss um, the structure of the transition. And I, I just appreciated so much as well the historical perspective that you provided with regard to um, you know, transitions in the mid 20th century and then uh, the 2008 and then 2012 uh, transitions as well. So just very, very helpful. And we need to talk about the impact of 2002 <laughs> also uh, at some point. Uh, yeah, the uh, uh, Bush v. Gore, as in two thousand. Yes, we 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 absolutely will. Um, so I look forward to hitting that and a number of other issues as we as we as we go forward and, and involve our panel. Um, so right now, I'd like to go with uh, I'd like to go to Megan Casella, uh, who's at Politico magazine, um, who's covering the current uh, transition, uh, very much in the midst of it. Um, and uh, so Megan, uh, try to give us a sense of how this transition is actually going, how it's unfolding, um, you know, what's you know, what is happening, what's not happening, um, and how much of this seems to come back to um, the fact that the head of the GSA, um, the administrator of the GSA, did not do something called ascertainment under the Presidential Transition Act, which is uh, just a determination by um, the head of the General Services Administration that um, th there's an apparent president-elect. It's not a determination by the head of the General Services Administration, 
formally of who won the election, because of course, as Professor Foley explained to us, um, that only happens uh, as a result of the Electoral College meeting and then uh, Congress counting the electoral votes. Um, but there's this practical just ascertainment by the director, sorry, by the administrator of the General Services Administration that we have an apparent presidential elect, and then that allows the transition process to unfold. So Megan, how much, how much is that, you know, just administrative step um, uh, integral to what's happening? And again, just kind of what's happening and what's not. Uh, Megan Casella. Sure. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to be here and happy to start with the ascertainment. It really is the, um, you know, the center of the conversation these days, which we didn't quite expect. I mean, before the election, we were talking a lot about what might happen? What might President Trump try to do to slow down this transition? Will he you know, be open to working with the Biden team and so forth? And so what we found out pretty quickly is that um, even after the election was called on Saturday, the GSA administrator, who is a Trump appointee, her name is Emily Murphy, she has not taken the step yet to make that ascertainment. And what that does is it affirms Biden vic Biden's victory and it unlocks a series of steps. Um, so, you know, there's some things that can go forward without it, and there are some things that cannot, and I can talk a little bit about each of those. Um, and so, you know, in the past, this has never been much of a political step. Uh, Chris Liu, who led President Obama's transition in 2008, he said that the ascertainment came so quickly that year that he watched the victory speech and went to bed sometime around one in the morning and missed the ascertainment coming in because it came in so quickly right after he had gone to sleep. Um, so it's not usually something that there's any sort of delay. And now we're more than a week past the election being called. Um, and there's there's sort of no end in sight for this standoff. So because of that, there's a lot of focus on what isn't happening. Um, one of the things there is that the president-elect is not receiving his presidential daily brief, a collection of the country's top intelligence. And I have a feeling you, got, you all may get into this a little bit more um, moving forward. But what that means is, you know, there's concern that it could be a national security threat moving forward. The reason that president-elects tend to get that briefing is so that once they're in the Oval Office, you know, there's no gap in understanding the, the threats to the country. There's no gap in understanding everything that's going on. And uh, the 9-11 Commission that actually went and looked back at various ways that um, that the country might have been able to pick up on this threat. One of the reasons that they say they might not have been was because of that shortened transition in 2000, Bush v. Gore, which Martha just mentioned as well. So there's a lot of concern increasingly among members of Congress, Democrats, and some Republicans now that by not allowing him to get that daily briefing, it's a threat to the country's national security. That's one thing that's not happening. Um, Biden's also not able to work with the Office of Government Ethics to work through some financial disclosures and. Um, conflicts of interest for his possible cabinet appointees and so forth. It's sort of a secondary step. That's not too much of an issue until we get closer into late December or so forth. Um, he's not able to access any money either from the government, um, but they do, they have been doing a lot of fundraising. So that's not so much of an immediate threat either at this point. But most importantly, he and his team are not able to have any contact with current government employees at the various federal agencies. Normally the agency review process gets started almost immediately within just a few days after the election is called. There are hundreds of people who head into those agencies. They have office space carved out for them and they start sharing information and just getting up to speed on everything that's happening in that agency and where they might need to make decisions within the first few weeks of the next term, um, You know where there might be outstanding issues and that sort of thing. And none of that can happen um, until the ascertainment is made. So you know, it's, it's something that would be a big deal in any transition, but there's a lot of concern that given the nature of the crises facing the country right now, it's actually a bigger deal than normal. Um, and an example is, is probably the coronavirus vaccine. They can't be sharing information on that right now. So even though a lot of it's public, you know, we, we heard good news this morning from Moderna on their vaccine. Last week we heard about Pfizer's, but it means that the Biden team can't be working with the Trump team right now on you know, a distribution plan or a rollout or how they're gonna make sure that they can scale it up and, and get it available across the country, um, especially to rural areas and so forth. None of that work is happening at this point. And so that's the type of thing that can be really slowed down by not being able to have the agency review process going on. Um, but one thing I do wanna focus, wanna touch on too before I um, pass it on is, is that, you know, I also wanna focus on what is happening, which is still a lot. Um, you know, the Biden team is really trying to project calm and, and sort of a business as usual type um, 
you know, characterization of this. There, you know, Biden is meeting constantly with transition advisors. He's getting an economic briefing today, for example, and meeting with CEOs and labor leaders. Um, he's giving a speech today. He gave one last week on the coronavirus. Today it's on the economy. He's been talking with foreign leaders and doing all sorts of things. And he's actually barely acknowledging. I mean, he's really not often acknowledging what uh, is going on with the GSA at all. He's really trying to say, you know, we've only been out of power for four years. M many of his team worked with him in the Obama administration. So they're saying it's not that big of a deal that we're not in there yet. And they're just trying to make clear that, you know, they're moving forward with their plans and doing as much as they can, even though every day that they're not in the agencies, for example, is sort of a delay. Um, and so, you know, they're moving forward with their cabinet vetting and so forth. That's something that can happen. They have access to FBI background checks, for example. And so they're working to put together that team. Biden announced his chief of staff last week. It wasn't really a surprise. He, he chose a longtime aide, Ron Klain, who has experienced both in economic recovery and an epidemic response with Ebola. Um, so he was chosen there and that is standard to be the first pick because the chief of staff will then help assemble the rest of the team. And we expect to be getting more announcements pretty quickly. This week, we think we might get some other White House staff announcements such as National Economic Council Director, maybe Press Secretary, Communications Director, and that sort of thing. And then next week and close to Thanksgiving, we expect to start getting some of the first cabinet appointees. So Treasury Department is likely gonna be pretty early on to start crafting their economic response to the virus. Um, uh, Health and Human Services Secretary for the same reason could be an early one. Some of the high profile ones like State Department, uh, Secretary of State and Defense Department, some of those we may get pretty quickly as well. So, you know, despite all of this talk about the GSA ascertainment, the Biden team is really working pretty hard to uh, make sure that the focus is also on the work that they're doing as well to try to really get up to speed. And, you know, they say, regardless of all the noise, he will be president on January 20th. And, and that's where they're trying to keep their focus. Um, one last thing as an aside that I saw there was already a question about how the need to rebuild the government is affecting this transition. And I've been doing some reporting there, so I wanted to address that as well at this point. And it is affecting this transition. They're very clear eyed about the fact that the civil service has really been pretty hollowed out under the Trump administration. And they've been attacked relentlessly called the deep state. And a lot of the political appointee positions were also never filled. Um, some of the numbers are pretty striking. The agriculture department is 6,000 employees smaller than it was at the start of Trump's term. The education department has shrunk by 14%, the labor department by 12%. And so they're they're looking at this and, and understanding that they need to appoint as many as thousands more people than usual to get them ready to head into the government on inauguration day. So they actually started fundraising for that over the summer when they saw that Biden's lead was holding and knew they were gonna have to hire so many more people um, and they're, you know, they're already reaching out to Capitol Hill and saying, send us your best and brightest, give us your recommendations. And they know that this is something they need to do. They're also looking at different ways to undo some executive orders and so forth to try to boost morale and just really to send a message to federal government employees that we know you've been sort of beaten and battered for the past four years and, and this is going to be the start of something new and, and we respect your work and, and they're trying to set the tone that, you know, please stay, don't retire and, and, um, you know, we'll get you some better treatment moving forward. So with that, I'll give it back to you, Dakota. Excellent. Thanks so much, Megan. Very, very informative about this very unusual transition that we're, we're part of. Um, I understand that you have your responsibilities as a reporter. You have a speech you need to cover um, in about half an hour. Um, stay as long as, as you certainly can. Um, if, you're, if, if you're still with us when we wrap up our, our initial statements by our panel, I'd, I'd love to go back to you for one of our first questions. Um, but of course, we again certainly understand that you have a very busy day job. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you. So next I'd like to go to David Priest. Um, David Priest is a former CIA officer um, who literally wrote the book on briefing the President of the United States and other top officials um, via uh, Washington's most exclusive briefing, which is the PDB, the President's Daily Brief on Intelligence. Um, David is deeply expert in this area and can talk with us about um, how it works uh, in a normal transition um, to brief up the incoming team on intelligence, why that's important, um, and uh, David also will be addressing um, how a transition looks from the standpoint of the agencies um, with these, these called ARTs, uh, agency review teams, sometimes called a parachute team or a landing team, uh, coming from the transition to federal agencies 
uh, to talk with people inside the building and get up to speed and, and how that's a, um, a special challenge in the highly classified world of uh, intelligence. So uh, David Priest, thanks for being here. Over to you. Thanks, Dakota. And thanks to everyone who's spoken already and set the stage for, for this part. The, the intelligence side is similar to and different from the overall transition dynamics. Um, it's, it's similar to because everything that happens in a national security agency or department um, has to happen there just as it does everywhere else. So yes, you will have landing teams, you will have people who are preparing to either serve in the administration or, or serving to get those connections made who do need to get up to speed on policies, plans, personnel, what slots are open and need nominations, things like that. And then the other side of that is that the incoming team as they get named often start getting the briefings. And so you will have teams within places like the CIA that will start preparing largely written materials, but also some oral presentations uh, for officials to get them up to speed. Because on January 20th, when Joe Biden takes that oath of office, um, national security is in their lap and they need to be prepared with everything up to that point. So that's some of the mechanics stuff. Uh, some of the better stories about intelligence and transitions uh, really do center around the, the president elect. And going back to something Martha said, there are traditions, and they are traditions. These are not in statute. Uh, there are some traditions that go all the way back to the 1950s, whereby during the campaign, the sitting president allows the major party candidates to receive classified briefings, um, overviews of the world situation. This is not the president's daily brief. Before the election, candidates for the office do not get to see the crown jewels. Uh, they get to get an overview kind of a, a tour of the international situation, which goes into some depth, but it, it's not exceptionally detailed and it doesn't get into sources and methods of intelligence at all. That changes after the election. Then traditionally, at least, it has really turned to where the president brings in the president elect, the vice president elect, and often now as they get nominated senior national security uh, positions, bring them into the intelligence picture. Up until now, that has included the president's daily brief. But the president's daily brief is not mentioned in the Presidential Transition Act or its updates. So yes, this year we do have the Office of the Director of National Intelligence releasing a statement saying, no, they're not getting this briefing to the Biden team because we don't have the determination from the GSA administrator yet. Well, that's not really how it works. That's almost what they're just choosing to hang it on. That's their excuse. But this is a presidential prerogative and it is not covered in the statute. So if Donald Trump wanted Joe Biden to be reading the president's daily brief now, he could turn it on and they could be briefing him now regardless of the ascertainment issue for the rest of the transition funding and other unlocking. Similarly, the GSA administrator Maybe we'll get out of this session and find out that she has made the ascertainment and that unlocks all of the things that we've talked about here. And Donald Trump can still say, but he's not seeing my PDB. Um, that is a presidential prerogative. It has never come up before because this has been a smooth process since the creation of the president's daily brief in the 1960s. Every regular transition has had the president elect receiving the PDB as soon as they want to after election day. Uh, there's only one exception, and it's the one that Martha brought up, which is 2000, which was unusual in many ways. It was very unusual for intelligence because one of the candidates who might win was Vice President Al Gore, who was already seeing the president's daily brief every day. The other candidate, George W. Bush, had not seen the PDB or national level intelligence to speak of. So a real asymmetry there in terms of who would be better prepared if they were to become the president on January 20th. So the Clinton administration had a tough choice to make. As the recount went on, time was ticking and it was down to a matter of a few weeks before there was going to be a new president. And at the beginning, they decided they could not bring Governor Bush into the PDB circle because the secrets in the PDB are truly a level above those in standard 
intelligence products, even classified ones, and certainly much more detailed and sensitive than those that are in the overview briefings that the candidates received during the summer and the fall before the election. But as time kept ticking, they realized that this couldn't go on. Um, John Podesta, who was working with Bill Clinton at the time, told me that they realized they had to let him in even before the recount was finished. So on December 5th of 2000, George Bush started seeing the president's daily brief. To date, he is the only person who has seen the president's daily brief as a candidate um, who had not yet been generally accepted as the president elect. Um, even then, that was a, a shorter transition. Um, it is true that the 9-11 Commission said that the short transition probably had some effect on preparedness that led to 9-11. They did not single out the president's daily brief on that because George W. Bush, as soon as he started seeing it, he sat with a CIA officer every day, spent a lot of time with the intelligence, and ended up with the most robust personal intelligence support as president of any president um, in terms of seeing briefers every single day, whether he was in Washington or not. So that's, that's how it normally works. Presidents elect get the PDB and the vice president elect gets read in as well. And senior national security officials are supposed to be brought in as they're getting nominated so they can get up to speed on these things. Um, this year, who knows? Uh, we're still in a situation where we don't know when the PDB is going to get to uh, Joe Biden. Um, I will end on this note regarding that so we have more time for Q&A. If you're going to have a situation where there's a shortened transition and there's a steep learning curve because of the limited time to get up to speed on the intelligence, you really want to have someone like Joe Biden. And I'm not talking politically in any way or ideologically. I'm saying it's really nice to have someone who was vice president for eight years, who was seeing the president's daily brief every day, and by all accounts, a very robust, serious intelligence consumer, who has only been out of office for four years, because it may be a steep learning curve for him on January 20th after a short transition, but he's going to be able to make up time quickly. He knows what intelligence is and isn't at that level. He knows what it can do for policy and what it can't do. And he also knows what it shouldn't be asked to do. Similarly, most of the senior national security positions in this administration are likely to be filled primarily by people who were in senior positions in the Obama administration. And that helps because the Obama administration had a functioning national security process. They had deputies committee meetings, they had principals committee meetings, they processed intelligence and policy in a functioning way. And the people who are coming into senior positions lived that. They saw how it is done. Maybe they want to make some adjustments here and there and how it's done, but they saw how it's supposed to work. They also will be able to make up for lost time on January 20th and get into the swing of things much faster than almost any other administration could. Um, the final note, this has been mostly about analysis. I've talked a lot about the, the PDB, which is an analytic product describing what's going on around the world. But during the transition, the president-elect is also brought into the range of covert action programs that the current president has signed findings on. They are the president's covert action programs. They are not the CIA's covert action programs. They are the presidents that the CIA executes. On January 20th, there's a different president. And each president has to decide as soon as they take the oath of office, are there some of these covert action programs that I don't want to continue? And we have had presidents very quickly after inauguration turn down some covert action programs that have been ongoing, introduce new ones. So that's an important part of the transition from an intelligence point of view is making sure the president-elect knows what's the covert action, what's the rationale, what's the time frame. What are the cost benefit calculations going into it? Because after taking the oath of office, Joe Biden owns those covert actions. Back to you. David, David, thanks so much for that just terrific overview of the intelligence component of transitions. Um, you were concise enough, uh, as any good briefer uh, would be, uh, to leave some extra uh, leave some extra time. So I want to take that extra minute that we've got with you and just, just ask one very quick follow-up. Uh, which is my understanding um, as to why 
recent transitions have had this idea of no surprises. That is that when the new president is sworn in at noon on January 20th and their team takes over, that they don't go into the sit room for their first briefing and find out that uh, some really remarkable uh, things are going on in the world and on the covert action front that the United States is clandestinely conducting um, uh, an extremely surprising and potentially perilous covert action. And then they have to scramble in office to get their hands around this. Is there, uh, David, is there a, a, a particular example of this that you could talk about that happened in the past where a new administration was shocked by a covert action that they inherited? And you know, uh, can you talk about that if it's there? Yeah, there are a few uh, historical examples that we can bring up, some of them before this modern transition machinery ever kicked in, and some of them due to abnormal transitions, I'll call them. Uh, for example, Franklin Roosevelt dying in office during World War II and Harry Truman coming in. He had a vague awareness that there was something about the Manhattan Project, but he didn't know the details. And suddenly he's commander in chief and has to decide, am I going to use these, these terrible weapons? Um, in the 1960 election, there was some controversy over what Nixon, who was vice president at the time, knew about the what would become the Bay of Pigs invasion, the covert action against Cuba, and what John Kennedy was or wasn't told during the campaign. So that can be an issue, but that's more of a, a campaign thing. During the transition, the president-elect is always made aware of these things. Not a pure intelligence issue, but it did involve intelligence briefings is a more recent example. And that's the example in 1993, as President George H.W. Bush was, was transitioning out and Bill Clinton was transitioning in. Bill Clinton did have some senior national security appointees who had served in previous administrations, but he had to reach back to the Carter years to do that, some 12 years earlier. Bill Clinton himself no exposure to national level strategic decision-making, uh, military and intelligence issues. And there was a major issue on the table, which was Somalia. And the Bush administration was involved in Somalia, but very transition. George H.W. Bush and Brent Scowcroft, his national security advisor, talked to the Clinton team and said, we are not going to make any decision that's going to lock you in. Even if it's in the national security interest of the United States, and we assess that on January 19th, we should do X, we are not going to do something that's going to fully lock you in. That would not be responsible of us. And I think that says a lot perhaps about the Bush administration, but it also says a lot about how a transition is supposed to work. There is a handoff coming and any responsible leader does not want to create a situation that will just be a mess to score political points against the person that they don't want occupying the Oval Office. Uh, hopefully we don't see that in January of 2021, but this is the first time since I've been looking at these issues that I'm actually concerned about it. Perfect, thanks so much, David. Um, we now go to uh, Petra Smelter, uh, who served on the uh, 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 Obama-Biden transition and is now serving on the Biden-Harris transition. Um, as we've alluded to in uh, our conversation so far, there, there are a number of clearance processes that occur for uh, the new team coming in. Uh, one of these is a, uh, a, a background check conducted by the FBI um, to look into any sort of criminal record um, that uh, any part of the new team uh, might have, any concerns about that. Um, it was interesting to hear from uh, to hear from uh, Megan Casella that it sounds like at least that process is available, despite how uh, uh, delayed other aspects of the transition is, that that still can go forward and that's good. Because uh, you certainly don't want a new team to come in where people have a criminal record or they're being investigated by the government. Um, you know, they've been indicted and it's not a public, a public matter. So that's one process. A second process is um, uh, security clearance reviews. Um, sometimes senior uh, 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 nominees, uh, senior officials don't have a current clearance because they've been out of government. Um, and certainly when I was in the transition, that was something that we, that we helped work through. So they need a new clearance. Uh, sometimes people need uh, clearance upgrades. They need new tickets uh, to serve at a higher level. Um, and so that involves working with FBI and, and, and other agencies. Um, 
and also ensuring that your new team doesn't have any uh, contacts with foreign intelligence actors or foreign states that might raise questions about loyalty or concerns about blackmail. The third type of clearance is the one that we're, we're just so delighted to have Petra with us to talk about, which is um, avoiding conflicts of interest, financial conflicts of interest, and avoiding other ethical problems, and having um, nominees only go up to the Senate for uh, Senate confirmation, um, where all of these, where any potential or existing conflicts have been resolved, um, and of course making sure that the president-elect uh, and the vice president-elect themselves um, don't enter office with any sort of uh, conflicts of interest or ethical issues. Um, uh, Petra, can you walk us through uh, uh, what this, this, this ethics and conflict of uh, interest regime, um, uh, you know, what are, the, what are the key structures here and what are, the, what are the process points going ahead? Yes, so thank you for the warm welcome. I've enjoyed meeting you on the transition and you've become my long, lifelong friend. Um, yes. But basically the conflicts of interests are very, very tedious, just as, as ominous as it sounds, that's the reality of it. So through the history of US government, we typically were um, confronted with different situations that the previous government had not thought about and that's where from the conflicts of interest came into play. So basically conflicts of interest rules very, very, very uh, simplified means that if you are the head of FDA, you shouldn't hold any pharmaceutical stocks. That would be like a, you know, easy black and white answer because obviously you can make decisions about like, let's hypothesize Corona vaccine. And if Pfizer is the company that is developing it and you have um, that stock, you can basically manipulate essentially the market for personal gain. So that's what conflict of interest rules serve. Sometimes they are as obvious as my hypothetical and sometimes they are a lot less obvious. So because of that, we have created this whole system of conflict of interest and basically any cabinet level and sub cabinet level person has to get cleared, not only by the White House or by the Biden transition team, um, that's the incoming president elects team, but also by an independent agency that's called Office of Government Ethics. And I believe, was it Heather? Heather from Politico who touched base on that because, because Office of Government um, Ethics typically is an agency that takes its time. When you create a transition, everybody is young, enthusiastic, and everybody understands that on January 20, the president has to get sworn in and we have to have, you know, Secretary of Treasury and Director of CIA and all the tiers so that the government can take over. But the Office of Government Ethics is an independent agency. Therefore, they don't feel the same rush and they have the same federal, you know, labor laws and everything. So they know how much time it takes to clear people. So you kind of have to work backwards. So I would um, suggest that it's not only the GSA administrator's determination, but it's the fact that while, yes, the Biden-Harris team can work with the FBI on like security clearances and criminal background checks, in many ways, a lot more tricky and tedious is this like conflict of interest, financial interest determination that could potentially derail very well qualified candidates. And also, you know, it's um, people don't really understand that. And, and when you, the tool, how you tease out these conflicts of interest, it's called the SF-278. It's a government form and basically the way you work with it is like, you have to think you're peeling the onion. And so everything you own, you have to go to the like smaller, 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 smaller part. So like if you are a wealthy individual and you have sophisticated investments, you invest in some hedge fund, private equity fund, and that owns co underlying companies. And then the underlying companies can have debt by somebody else. So you basically have to disclose every single layer. And usually people will trip there more than they will with their criminal background check. And, and you know, that's the other part is that generally, if you will serve in the government, um, err on the side of over disclosure. I also represented private clients when President Bush was the president. So, you know, I've done this work for Republicans and for Democrats. And I have to tell you that basically 
you know, when criminal records get expunged, they are never really gone. And so in all of these forms, you have to over disclose because basically the government has a way to deal even with the conflicts of interest. So let's say the most qualified person um, for the director of CIA owns, I don't know, somebody who makes drones, some company. You know, there is ways to deal with that. Then you, the government enters with you into an instrument called ethics agreement. And there you will decide like how to deal with that, which typically means recusing yourself. But what you don't want is you want government that's ineffective. So we try to avoid the conflicts of interests in advance rather than deal with them while you're in the office because nobody would want a secretary of treasury who can make any decisions about um i don't know like secretary of treasury can own treasuries <laughs> whereas everybody else can own treasuries because secretary of treasury can actually manipulate the financial markets so it's kind of like what i do is very boring but it has to get done and it can be overcome. And unfortunately, we do, we depend on another agency, Office of Government Ethics, that typically doesn't have a lot of teeth, but it does in this process. And basically, if Office of Government Ethics will not certify a financial disclosure form, that person cannot participate in government. So that's sort of my, I will keep it very, very, very brief because um, because I have to actually jump off very soon. <laughs> and um, I'm happy to answer any questions if you guys have any follow-up questions about like nitty gritty if anybody is interested in this, but, but mark my words that we need time to get that cabinet ready. Otherwise it will not be smooth transition. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Petra. And I just, I just wanted to just, just drill down on one point. So, so you mentioned that um, during this process of trying to deal with potential conflicts of interest um, by top officials, right? Deal with those con those potential, those real or apparent conflicts or potential conflicts, right? In advance during the transition before they're in office, that one, uh, one solution. Um, you know, where, for example, you've got a, uh, a member of the incoming team who has financial assets, you know, on which then they would be able to exercise some sort of uh, influence. One, one approach to dealing with that uh, is uh, recusal um, in some way. Uh, my understanding is that, you know, the, in kind of a more granular form that uh, other, I mean, so one option is divestment. You can just sell the asset, right? Um, and then another is putting it in a blind trust where um, you no longer have any sort of uh, control over the asset. Um, could, you, could you just take 30 seconds and just say, you know, um, why might divestment be right in some circumstances and why might a blind trust be, you know, sufficient in another? And, you know, were you satisfied with how, you know, the Trump administration handled this, um, you know, four years ago when, you know, certainly the coverage of this described it as they were just saying, they're just blowing by a lot of these rules and just not following them. Yes, unfortunately, you know, I've been practicing this kind of law since like 2003. And I have to tell you that I have never seen a blind trust that got approved by the Office of Government Ethics and worked. Okay. <laughs> and I had a lot of clients from Rumsfeld to Paulson to all the, you know, all the top Republican donors, and then obviously on the side of government, um, all of our um, Obama, um, Obama government officials, and I've never seen that truly work because like, essentially, you would have to completely hand over any decision making over your assets, because if you know what's going in there, it's not truly blind. So it's kind of almost like, uh, I don't know if it's, I haven't looked it up if anyone has ever used it and at what point. Um, divestment is a good idea. And that's, that's why I also have a degree in tax law because yes, you can divest, but that comes with a price, you know? So, so in, in my case, like, you know, a good example would be like, would be like Henry Paulson, like Henry Paulson's wealth is crazy. And so he needed to very, very carefully restructure. And then it comes to how much private uh, price you want to pay for your government service because when you already serve in government people don't do it for the money right people want to make difference in policy people want to actually change all kinds of reasons but when you there is no 
tax rule exemptions for people. So if people have to divest ton of stocks, they will pay um, capital gains price. And so that's why people always want to find a way how to make it work. Mm -hmm. Another, um, another yeah, thing, that, another way um, is to, um, that you can resolve a, uh, a conflict is to have a waiver. And you can get a waiver, um, which the um, Obama administration right at the start had uh, trouble there. They had strong ethics rules mm -hmm. and they gave a waiver to William Lynn, who was mm -hmm. working as a uh, deputy secretary of defense. And he had been a lobbyist for Raytheon and um, <laughs> which would seem to fit in to the conflicts of interest. And so they, um, uh, they said that, um, uh, let's see, that um, uh, Peter Orsog, who was the head of OMB, was the one who signed, uh, who signed the waiver. I have determined that it's in the public interest uh, to grant the waiver given Mr. Lynn's qualifications for his position in current national secur security situation. Yeah. Uh, you know, as a practical matter, they are not a great idea. We want it. Unfortunately, this is a whole nother discussion, which is the Obama ethics pledge. Obama <laughs> ethics pledge was unworkable. It was spent together at the last hour, and it basically created an environment where people, it had unintended consequences because we want it to be the more ethical government Right. than any government before but you know the devil is in the details and the practicalities of washington is that people serve in the administration for a couple of years and then often they work on k street and it's about lobbyists going back and forth but and unfortunately the obama ethics pledge swept a lot of these people in whereas like in this case when you are a lobbyist for raytheon and you become a secretary of department of defense that just doesn't look good <laughs> It's a bad idea. You know, I don't want to criticize. I know Dakota asked me about the current administration and like obviously like having the Trump hotel there, you know, and that's where you host all the meetings and that's where all the business gets done. I live between LA, uh, DC and Sarasota now. And like uh, when I go there, if I have a business meeting there ever for lunch, like, I mean, I, I overhear the conversations and I'm very sensitive to it because I that's kind of my area. But yes, I think from one extreme and I think the waivers are mostly a little bit dangerous and a prudent government will not choose waivers. That's kind yeah. of like the last scenario. Terrific. Uh, well, uh, 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 thanks so much, Petra, and also Martha for, for, for chiming in. We can we can certainly uh, return to this uh, to this to this question during the Q during Q and A. I want to make sure that we get to Bill Doster next before we go to uh, our general Q and A session. Um, Bill is uh, I, I'm, I'm I'm so glad to see him here. He is just an an, an absolute legend, um, like so many of our, our our panelists here today. But uh, uh, Bill is. Somebody who served as as counsel to uh, the Senate Majority Leader, um, and it was just kind of a kind of a, a wise and Gandalf like figure when I worked for uh, the U.S. Senate. Um, you could you could go to him with questions; he would know the answer. He seemed to have magical powers to move Senate procedures, um, spells, incantations, motions. Um, and uh, Bill has also served in, in the White House Counsel Office. Um, these days, he is a uh, a professor at uh, uh, Maryland, is that right, Bill? Ten. Okay, terrific. Um, and uh, so, so Bill is going to talk for about ten minutes about uh, Congress's role in uh, presidential transitions and Congress's own transition between one Congress and another. Um, and Bill, I think you're going to share your screen. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Uh, over to you. Thanks for the invitation and thanks for that kind introduction, Dakota. So on the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, Ned mentioned that uh, four and a half senators have already said that the president is the president elect is president elect. I think that this is an early indicator of the acceptance in the Republican caucus that five and a half percent of uh, elected Republican Congress members have acknowledged the president elect 
is the president elect a week after the election has been declared. So that's th these are the four and a half senators you can expect that he can work with easily. You know, we all mentioned as well, the electoral college is coming along in middle of December, folks like these were in Indiana will take an oath, write out their electoral college numbers, and then we'll have the numbers there. But as Ned mentioned, that comes to a joint session in Congress set by at January 6th or such other date as Congress sets by statute. So sec January 6th in 2001 had Vice President Gore announcing the result that he had lost the election and he had to respond to House members who were objecting to the seating of delegations saying, well, if you're a House member and you don't have a Senate member joining your objection, then I can't hear your objection. Then in 2005, uh, Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs Jones was joined by Senator Boxer in an objection to seating of a delegation. That means that then each House has to meet separately for a two hour session and two hours alone. At the end of two hours, they vote, shall we uh, object to that uh, seating of that, uh, uh, those electoral votes? And so as Ned mentioned, it's highly likely that Congress will not change the result of the electoral college in that, in that proceeding. But I do think it is highly likely that you would have a House member and a Senate member in this Republican caucus that may want to object to the, some of the delegations. In the 2017 case, uh, Maxine Waters tried to raise an objection. No senator wanted to join her in joining in that objection. So Vice President Pence will sit on January 6th to preside along with Speaker Pelosi over this session to count the Electoral College votes. Meanwhile, we're all trying to figure out who's in charge in the Senate. January 5th, we have a runoff election in Georgia. Georgia, as everybody knows, is becoming more and more of a purple state, more and more of an urban state, and it's interesting. So that will determine who's going to be the majority leader in the, uh, in the Senate. And that makes a great deal of difference, as we'll get to in a moment. Because if there is a majority leader who's a Democrat, then there is an undivided government. Now this chart shows that undivided government is a rare thing. It's those dark color bands on the left here. So that in two thirds of the time, we have divided government and we have dysfunctional government. Only in about one sixth of the time, do you have the government that you wanna have in charge. And as well, as President Obama told Jerry Seinfeld, those are the times when you get every once in a while, you see an opening and you can do some legislating. Now it hasn't been since Grover Cleveland and none of us can remember Joe Grover Cleveland as old as many of us are, none of us can remember it, but that's the last time a democratic president came into office without controlling the Senate of his own. So I think that we need to think about lowering expectations about what Democrats can do. So here Ezra Klein ticks off all the different things Democrats wanted to do. If the Democrats don't win both of the Georgia seats, most of these things are not gonna be achievable. And using the Budget Act to use budget reconciliation to do a fast track vehicle, which many of the recent presidents have used to do major initiatives that they did, that's not gonna be possible if you have a divided government between the House and the Senate. So what happens if there's a 50-50 Senate? Just do, do this for, the, for giggles. On January 3rd in 2001, Vice President Gore was still vice president, even though he'd lost the election. So that meant the majority leader was Tom Gashel. But then on January 20th, Dick Cheney became vice president. So that means that Trent Lott became the, vice, uh, the, the uh, majority leader at that point. But wait, there's more, like the Ginzu knife commercials. There's more, folks. On June 6th, James Jeffers decided, I'm not going to caucus with the Republicans anymore. I'm going to caucus with the Democrats. So that meant that Tom Daschle became majority leader again. So when you have very close majorities, like if you have a 50-50 or a 49-51 majority, then everybody in the middle gets to be a, deal, a kingmaker. But let's say the most likely scenario, Mitch McConnell becomes majority leader. Majority leader determines a lot of the agenda of what's gonna happen in the Congress. You may recall that that's why we don't have Judge Garland on the Supreme Court. And that's why we do have uh, Amy Barrett on the Supreme Court by the single decision of the majority leader. So one analyst has said there's the Mitch McConnell handcuffs on what Democrats might want to do. 
So look at what happens in 2019. That means that three quarters of the votes that Mitch McConnell wants to have on the Senate floor are about nominations. Senators don't get to do a lot of legislating anymore in the Senate, and that's been more and more true. And if you're a minority senator in the Senate, they got five amendment roll call votes in 2019. I'd expect you can that, see that pattern continuing if we have a divided government. So people are looking, who are these best friends, the new power couple in Washington, Mitch McConnell and Senator Biden? Well, there is a potential Biden-McConnell agenda things like these that you could see them coming together and working together on. And things where there are real deadlines coming up that we're gonna to have to deal with, they might be working together on. But still, and the nomination process is gonna be rough for President-elect Biden. He's gonna either have to find uh, moderate Demo Democrats or moderate Republicans to be the nominees or try and move over liberals into acting positions. Then we have to worry about the Vacancies Act and how long they can stay there and who's eligible to do that sort of thing. And with judges, what sort of judges will Mitch McConnell want to deal with that, that Biden appoints? I think there's going to have to be some horse trading probably. I'll give you this judge from Texas if you give me those judges from New York. Or maybe we can cut some slack for places where senators have bipartisan commissions where they put it out of their own hands to pick who the judges are. So going back to this, this uh, power couple, when those guys started in the Senate, they were in a different Senate, my friends. In the 1980s, half of the Republican caucus was more, more conservative, uh, or half of the Republican caucus was more liberal than the most conservative Democratic senator from Alabama. And two thirds of the, of the Democratic caucus was more conservative than the most liberal Republican senator from Connecticut. So there was a lot of room for overlap and, lap and working in the middle. That has moved to the separate corners since then. And so here's the last five years as GovTrack displays the, the distribution of the current Senate. And there's really not that many people in the middle to do deals on, you know them by name. And one of them just lost his election. So the idea that some Democrats have that we'll just pick off some moderates to get to a deal, you pick off the people who are truly moderates, you'll get to 50 senators, and that's not enough to do anything. Remember, Mitch McConnell can choose what you're doing. Remember these guys and where they're on the Supreme Court or not. So, and also in the Senate, as one House chairman once said, you can't go to the bathroom without 60 votes. So how are you gonna get to 60 votes? If you have to get the 12 most liberal Republicans, that means you're also getting McConnell into the mix. Senator McConnell is probably more concerned with the bulk of his caucus, which is to the right of him. Yes, folks, most of the two thirds of the Republican caucus is to the right of Mitch McConnell. So that's where he has to watch out for to make sure that he is maintaining control of his caucus. So Mitch McConnell's dream is, I'll just pick off 12, uh, uh, or I'll just pick off eight uh, Democrats and that'll get me to the majority. But then you know what Nancy Pelosi will do with those bills. So what you probably get is a consensus that is pretty close to unanimous consent, where you have to get pretty broad consensus in order to get it through the McConnell Senate and get him to want to consider it and get it to be able to pass into law. So that means some small potatoes, and that means we'll continue the process of very few laws being enacted, and the Senate will continue to be where good ideas go to die. Now, what, are there ways around the United States Senate? Are there ways to get around this? Well, as was mentioned, Megan mentioned, regulations will be a, a good sphere for a lot of what goes on in the, uh, in the Biden administration. And one might also consider a lot of those late Trump regulations will be susceptible to the Congressional Review Act. So a fast track procedure that gets around the majority leader, he can't decide whether or not to consider them, he has to, and there's limited time, so it's a majority vote. So to do those, you'll have to go through an analysis to the, does it make sense to use this review act, but it's possible that you can then turn over some of those late uh, Trump regulations with a ma simple majority vote. Also, there's a fast track procedure for trade agreements. One could imagine that, that the incoming Biden administration could cut some deals which would be both environmentally friendly or business friendly at the same time. And you could get to some fast track vehicles with a simple majority vote and still be able to get them th some things done. And it's not too early friends to start thinking about the 2022 election. I know Democrats and Republicans in Congress are. And so 
some senators are more vulnerable other than the Republican side, some senators more vulnerable than others on the Democratic side. People will be paying attention to these senators, trying to court them, but also be worried about trying to take care of them in coming into the next election. And as Francis Lee has pointed out, that means that Senator uh, McConnell may have very little interest in helping Cort Senator Cortez Masto do anything in the Senate because he may want to be trying to get that seat back. And in the end, how this all works out will depend in large part on this guy and what sort of decisions he makes, as people have been saying. And he can go all sorts of different ways on this. But at least, as people have been mentioning, it looks like they're bringing in the A team here so that we, in 65 days, we can expect a transition to a little bit more normalcy. And that's the picture as I got to show. Thanks so much, Bill. Uh, concise and to the point and informative uh, as always. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to go to Q and A, um, and we've be, been been getting a number of really really terrific questions uh, using the Q and A function here. Um, I want to start off with a question um, for uh, for Martha Joint Kumar. Um, this question is from uh, John Royans. Uh, John asks. How long can we continue under the current status of a delayed transition uh, without having major problems develop? Uh, Martha Joint Kumar, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Bush uh, in 2000 had 37 days for a transition, and that was it. But um, while his appointments in the national security area may have um, have been an issue later on after September 11th. I would say he really managed uh, his transition well. What he did was he stayed in Crawford, let Jim Baker take care of the Florida vote, and he focused on uh, choosing his cabinet and, uh, and the deputies. And then he thought through how he was going to come into office. And he decided that um, he wanted to come in as a bipartisan uh, leader as much as he could, that he wanted to telegraph that he may have been a Republican candidate, but he was going to be president of all the people. So what they did is they, they, they uh, took from their campaign. And that is one of the things that I think Biden has been following this, this script. In your campaign, focus on a limited number of issues and what the priorities are. And then when you come in, roll them out. And so, so that you don't have a lot of surprises for the public. They know what it is that you're interested in doing. And so in his case, the first issue that he dealt with was education. And he would take a week for each of these issues and he would have his cabinet uh, secretaries talking about it and he had a communications plan around it. And that it was, uh, Carl Rove was very in, involved in developing it. So the first week was education and he brought Democrats into the White House, as well as the Republican leaders. And he brought in Ted Kennedy from the Senate, uh, from his role as an education committee, and George Miller in the House, um, who was the, um, uh, the lead on for Democrats on education. So then he did faith-based offices um, it, including one in the White House and then uh, also in the departments, uh, his second week, and then military spending, uh, tax cuts. So what he did, don't look backwards, look forwards. And um, I looked up how many times he had used the word election, and it's almost nil. And it was somebody else's election, uh, not, not his own. So in that is a contrast with Trump, who simply could, couldn't stop talking about the election and, uh, and how he had been maligned. Um, so he had um, a good uh, policy start and he had, um, he had thought through, through the appointment process. He had Clay Johnson who uh, ran his appointment process as uh, governor 
and who was a, a businessman that who was uh, one of his closest friends running that a process so that they would be able to have uh, resumes come in through computers and, and then uh, be able to handle them that way, which they were able to do. So he really set things up uh, well during that time period and was able to come in as, as president of all the people. And so, so even though he did not have a plurality of votes, in the first Gallup poll, he had, um, it, after he came into office on job approval, it was 57%. And Trump with a uh, different type of transition where there was little preparation that was used, um, he came in under 50% and he's never reached 50% since. And so what you do at the beginning establishes who you are and what your reputation is. And it's very important. Thanks so much. Um, uh, uh, David Priest, from a standpoint of, of, of intelligence, I'd like to uh, get your thoughts on, you know, at, at, you know, what's your sense? At what point does the transition normal processes um, bec become delayed so long that you get really nervous? Um, and then, you know, so, and then after addressing that, that there, we've, we've had a couple of really interesting questions in, in the, in the, uh, uh, the Q and A box too, if you want to address any of those, but, um, just say a word if you could about kind of at what, what point, you know, do you as an intelligence professional start to get nervous? I don't get as nervous as I would in, in some other areas, um, because people can get briefed up on intelligence relatively quickly if they need to be, it's not ideal. But if a transition is a matter of even just a few weeks, you can make a lot of that short time by having very intense sessions and bringing people up to speed. Um, the danger really is on the one I mentioned on the covert action side is you don't want Joe Biden deciding on the morning of January 20th to make rush decisions about covert action programs that um, often involve people's lives. That's the kind of thing you want some serious study involved in. But in terms of the operation of intelligence, in terms of the provision of intelligence to whomever the incoming officials are, um, that will happen whether or not uh, there is a transition to speak of. The danger, of course, is the missing leadership in the intel agencies, just as it would be in other agencies and departments. Um, this is probably the greater concern because typically you have a, a great wealth of expertise, even at the senior levels of agencies and departments in the um, career professionals, not the political appointees. And as acting officials, they can do a pretty good job of keeping the machinery moving. Um, this administration has, while not gutted those senior levels of senior officials, um, we're probably starting at a, a worse place for that than many other administrations would coming in. But let's not kid ourselves. There are still some very capable civil servants serving at the senior levels of all of these agencies and departments that can keep the ship running uh, if there is a delayed transition. Terrific, thanks so much. Um, Ned Foley, um, we, we have a couple of questions here in the, in the Q&A box that I'd, I'd love to put to you. Maybe, um, maybe we'll start with the one, this question, and a few of the questions resonate with this. Is, is it, so I'll, I'll go, for example, to the one from uh, William Zapp, who asks, uh, is, there a is there a date or event after which uh, Trump must allow the transition to occur? Yeah, so let me address that. But, but first, I saw another question I think that's also important to address, um, because it is true that Senator McConnell was very careful in saying that President Trump is entitled to pursue legal avenue. He did not embrace President Trump's own claims of fraud, the ones that have no factual basis as so many fact checkers have, have debunked and as the courts are debunking. So I, I think that's important to note that Senator McConnell speaking on behalf of his caucus is saying there's a process, the process is allowed to go forward to certification. In fact, uh, Senator McConnell's statement said Democrats should welcome that because if it ends up the way Democrats think it's going to be. It will validate their claims uh, to the to the result of the election. Um, so, hey, I want to note that for the record. But I also think that does 
underscore my point that uh, at the time in which certification does come, I, I would hope that more Republicans acknowledge not just the fait accompli of, of Biden's inauguration and that they're stuck with him as president for four years, but that they acknowledge, um, uh, as Republicans did, believe it or not, back then with Grover Cleveland, you know, the Republican Party looked two weeks for fraud to see whether or not Grover Cleveland shouldn't have been uh, inaugurated. But then they said, we look, we couldn't find any fraud. And in fact, he won fair and square. And so I hope that the Republicans this year can say, you know what, we looked hard for fraud. It just wasn't enough to deprive uh, uh, President Biden of an authentic win. Um, but again, we're, we're not quite there yet. Um, now to your point, though, and, and, about and, is there anything and, that and has if I could to just, happen? Yeah, go ahead. So sorry, I just wanted to jump in there um, uh, just on, on noting Gro Grover Cleveland. I mean, that might be an especially um, uh, important uh, analogy to draw because, of course, Grover Cleveland is the only U.S. president who served a term, was defeated for re-election, and then was re-elected to the presidency. Um, and of course, President Trump, according to a number of media accounts, has been talking with advisors about 2024, um, you know, very, very soon, right? That, that that might come in in place of a concession. So, you know, maybe that is actually a very useful analogy, both on fraud and on his own plans. No, absolutely. I've thought a lot over the past couple of weeks about how, you know, there was this earlier period of hyperpolarization in American history, which was the Gilded Age, the 18. 80s and 1890s. Um, and we did have this back and forth between the two parties in terms of control of the White House and also, you know, complicated control of Congress, both chambers at the time. And yet, um, to my knowledge, you know, neither the Republicans or the Democrats attempted to kind of repudiate the legitimacy of the victories for the White House when they came. So after Grover Cleveland was himself defeated, uh, in 1888, he withdrew, and, and President Harrison came in, and the public, uh, and then you know Grover Cleveland came back. That's sort of the right way to do it. You take turns <laughs> when you win or you lose. The problem right now is there seems to be uh, an unwillingness to take turns, uh, at least sufficient acceptance that two-party competition and fair play requires acknowledging when when your side actually loses. Um, so, you know, how, and, and that goes to the, the, the questions about transition, you know, I wonder to what extent, and I come at this from an election law perspective, you know, that our, that our laws of transition and this notion of ascertainment that the administrator has to give and the who, who gets the president, presidential daily briefing when, you know, there should be transition related or governance related norms and goals to determine that, that shouldn't necessarily depend on election results. I mean, it is true, you know, that 2000 was anomalous in that the recount in Florida lasted so long, but we've got to acknowledge that our system is built for the possibility of that. Now, President Trump may be inaccurate in trying to claim that what's going on this year is the equivalent factually to what happened in 2000, but legal process wise, you know, you do have to certify results. You do have to go through recounts as Georgia is doing when they occur. And if 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 the timetable to, for electoral closure doesn't work from a governance perspective in transition, then we have to decouple the two, I think, for governance related reasons and just say, okay, there's an electoral process that will give us official electoral winners when the electoral college meets or whatever. But if the necessities of governance requires reading into both sides certain facts and conditions about, you know, governmental policy, you know, somebody I think it was mentioned for successful transitions, some of this work has to be done before election day, over the summer, right? Uh, and so um, we should create a schedule uh, for governance motives that doesn't require on anybody to declare a victory. Um, and and whether that occurs before no November 1st for some portions because that's needed or it occurs on November 15th because that's the right timetable regardless of whether the electoral process has reached a conclusion. Those dates should be set and, and methodology should be determined for transition reasons without depending upon an elect conclusion. And, and again, you tell me whether for governance teams, 
for governance reasons, you need to let these parachute teams take place, you know, potentially on both sides. You know, now as a practical matter, if you get a concession speech from a candidate, whether an incumbent or a challenger who says, look, I realize I've lost, then you can take away the need to read in that team for transition purposes, right? Because if they say, look, there's not a prayer of me taking over all, taking uh, on the Oval Office on January 20th or my team doing so, then don't waste money and taxpayers time and attention for, for that. But as long as you've got a live claim to power that needs to be respected, um, that team has to be involved uh, in transition. Now, the odd thing right now is you've got the incumbent administration claiming victory when it's not really a valid claim as a practical matter. But um, so one interesting question would be, what if the shoe were, you know, what if Trump were the challenger, not the incumbent, with the electoral results being the same way? You know, should then, should the Trump team be read into transition in that context? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. You could say, well, it's such an implausible claim. He, he, he doesn't deserve the process, but from an electoral perspective, until we get results, we don't have, we don't have an official winner yet. Uh, and, and so for, for, for Ned and, and for, uh, for Martha, um, are, there, are there any tools that Congress has that could in, in some way um, you know, force or prompt um, the incumbent administration um, to you know, begin this transition process? Uh, yes, uh, informally. Um, and I assume that that's happening now. Having a mixture of people that were coming uh, that are coming forward, and more and more people are coming forward in the Republican Party and saying it's time that we know who the winner is here. Um, you know, my grandson, who's eight years old, know, knew that Biden had won won the election. <laughs> we all know that he's won, and it's time to get the transition on the road because. It, uh, it's going to affect Trump's legacy um, and uh, Republicans, I think, probably are worried that it's going to affect theirs, too, if they don't come forward, because uh, they're looking at it through the prism of national security requirements. And, um, and the public understands that. You need to know when you're uh, the president-elect. So I think it's really the most effective with uh, Trump is dealing uh, with him um, outside of the of, of public view. But that doesn't mean that he's not gonna be very upset as more people come, come out and say, time to go. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, two minutes left. Um, so I just thought we'd just go just very briefly, 30 seconds from, from each of our panelists. I know Actually, we've uh, a number of our panelists already had other commitments, but we we, we still do have uh, uh, David and Ned and Martha. Uh, just thirty seconds from each of you. Any any closing thoughts? Sure. Hey, you want to go first? Yeah. I'll, let me just jump in quickly and address a couple of the questions in the Q and A while doing it in twenty nine seconds. Um, there's some concerns about um, have we had an ex president who was a security risk before because of his um, being aggrieved. Uh, and feeling done wrong. Um, we've had upset presidents before, but we've never had a, a real historical precedent for this. However, my concern isn't so much about what Donald Trump will do after he leaves office with whatever national security information he has somehow retained, as I am about what he does before January 20th, because he is the commander in chief. He has the full powers and duties of the office. He has already bent and broken some norms and traditions. There are many more that he could do. And that's why I think Martha's point about people going to him and talking to him privately, trying to get him out the door uh, before he shatters what's left of presidential norms is, is much more of a risk than what happens after January 20th. Thanks. Terrific. Thanks, David. Uh, Ned? No, I just want to say it's been a great event. And um, I, again, I we need to do better. We need, we need to understand our system better and implement our system better. So I hope this is the first of many conversations so that four years from now, we're in a much better place than we are now. 
Agreed. Uh, Martha, uh, the last word is for you. Oh, well, uh, this really has been a nice event and I've, um, I've learned from it uh, myself. And I think that uh, David is right, that it's not what he does afterwards, although he's gonna continue to try to uh, delegitimize institutions and his attacks on institutions and his belief that um, the government was not a force of good, but, but uh, something you wanna minimize, I think is, um, is, uh, has been, has been uh, dangerous and it, um, it puts a real burden on uh, Biden of how to try to deal with the public on what it is that the government does that it's, um, it's a force to help you, not harm you. And I, th I think that he tried that as part of his campaign and that that uh, was effective. But I worry about, let's say his tweet about how he wants to have troops out of Afghanistan. Um, is he uh, really going to um, uh, to try to uh, to do that? Um, so I think their actions and the the whole issue over Schedule F of taking um, employees um, that are um, career people and trying to um, uh, basically make them at will so that they're easily fired, and uh, that that is a, a that is a concern as well. Great. Well, thanks so much. Um, so on behalf of the Moritz College of Law and the Mershon Center for, for International Security Studies, I hope all of us will join me in, in thanking our, our wonderful panel of uh, Martha Joint Kumar, Ned Foley, David Priest, um, and our other colleagues, uh, Bill and Petra, um, and uh, Megan, who, are, who had to depart earlier. But uh, uh, thanks so much to each of you um, for your contributions of expertise as we explore just these really, really interesting, urgent, and uh, ramified issues. Um, so thanks to all of you and to everyone listening. Uh, I hope you, you stay safe and are able to uh, enjoy our, our upcoming holidays despite uh, these disrupted times. <laughs>